Glad you're here. Whether you're here in person or for those of you, would you do me a favor and put your hands together for those who are online this morning? God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Um, if we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for choosing to come out and worship with us this morning. I believe God is in the house and the songs that we sang a little bit earlier, we didn't plan them together with the worship team, but as God often does, he knitted them together with this message on Jesus the King came to set you free. Can I get an amen to that one, right? We do serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we're in this message series entitled The King is Here. Um, two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to preach, and when I did, um, we talked about the fact that there are really two kingdoms at play right now, and they are sadly at war with each other, right? There's the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of Satan, and we find ourselves in the midst of this epic battle that has been occurring since far before mankind was on earth and began to manifest on earth when our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, um, sinned in the garden, right? They were tempted by Satan himself. They fell under the power of sin and every generation since then has been born in sin and sadly were born under the dominion of the evil one and it does seem that things get eviler and eviler as each year goes by. But we're not really here so much to talk about evil today. We're here to talk about the king that came to set us free. You see, I concluded that message a couple of weeks ago with the fact that God sent his one and only begotten son to go behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to save people like you and I. And that very day, God saved a number of people right here at Journey Church. They gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And if that was one of you who were here today, man, keep learning, keep growing, keep growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Keep coming back and let God move in your heart and draw you into that place where you can become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. If you're already saved in this place, would you keep growing? Would you keep learning? Would you keep coming back? Would you keep serving? Would you keep living your life to make a difference in the lives of others? And would you use maybe this Christmas season as an opportunity to invite people who are far from Jesus to come into a relationship with Jesus? You know, you can do that personally at home. People don't have to get saved just right here. Can I get an amen, right? I mean, you could, you could share wherever you find yourself, at work, out on the streets, wherever you have that opportunity, especially even on social media, places like that. So, but, you know, there is this unique moment in time where people are more receptive on times like um, Resurrection Sunday or on Christmas weekend where they'll come. So maybe be strategic this week. You know, how many, how many of you ever actually like mail something anymore? Do you have any stamps still at your house? A few of you? Like, you know, it only takes like a day or so to get a mail from here to somewhere else in Jacksonville. You know, maybe on Monday, go out there and put a couple notes in there and invite some people to church this coming weekend. And then on Tuesday, you could go out there and text every friend in your contact list. And then on the next day, go out there and email everybody on your contact list. Do you know these things that we have in our pockets actually can still make phone calls? Yes. You can maybe on Thursday go and make some phone calls, right? Do some one-on-one -on -one invitations. But here's what I tell you. You know, I've come to that realization more and more as I get older, you know, as I found myself in hospital beds or sat at the hospital beds of others, that, uh, you know, life is short. And we don't want to see any of our friends, you know, die and go into hell, into a separation from God for all eternity. And it's not very difficult to send an invite to somebody. In fact, Adam and the team, they put together those cards, you know, use them. Maybe even go out there. Maybe you didn't have plans to go to the mall. Go to the mall this afternoon for a couple of hours. Participate in that and see what God does. I mean, no greater joy than, you know, seeing somebody come to know Jesus. You know, I posted a simple picture this weekend. We had a wonderful moment with my grandkids where we were talking about Hanukkah, and it, it was just awesome. And then it, it turned, and, and somebody commented something on there, and I was able to go back and say, you know, these moments are short. Live your life to make a difference in the lives of others. And Will, who's not here this morning, but I see you are, you know, Will comments, about, Eric, you made a difference in my life like 15 years ago. You know, he and I, I think back to the time that it met, 
there was a, a chamber of commerce meeting at their old place where they had on Kingsley. And he was there because he became a new person coming to the chamber and he was trying to get connected. I happened to be there that morning and we bumped into each other while we were hanging out in the hallway there and we started talking. And then he goes, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor. What do you do? He worked for AT&T, I think at the time. He was selling phones or Verizon, one of the two. And he's like, well, I go, do you got a church? You, you just, no. I said, why don't you come? And, you know, man, their lives have been changed for all that time since then. It just takes a simple moment wherever you're at to share Jesus. And that's what the season's really all about. That's the essence of the good news of the gospel. He changed lives then and he's still changing lives today. And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with him, I pray that you would find him now. I pray that this very day you would surrender your life to none other than King Jesus. He is here in this room. He loves you and he wants you to be a part of his family. Father, we come before you this morning with grateful and thankful hearts, declaring as we sang earlier that you are the King of Kings, you are the Lord of Lords, you are the one who sits at the right hand in the very throne room of God. You came from heaven to earth to show us the way and you're coming back soon and we can't wait to see you in person. Lord, we want as many people to come along with us as possible. So we pray that if anybody be under the sound of my speaking today, whether in this place or online, that you use it to touch their hearts, change their hearts, and transform them and draw them into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name. And everybody says. Amen. You know, we sang some incredible songs about the name of Jesus a little bit earlier there's a older group, uh, Bill and Gloria Gaither. Some of you may remember them if you're old enough. You young people are like, we don't have no clue who those people are, right? But they, they penned a song some time ago called There's Something About That Name. It's been sung all over the world, and it speaks of kings and kingdoms and this name that is above every other name. Its lyrics say, Jesus, 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 there's something about that name. Would you just say it one time? Jesus. 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 There's something about that name. It goes on to say, Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Lord, would it stop raining today? <laughs> We're ready for some of that fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. There's a name that is above every other name, and his name is Jesus. Let's talk just a little bit more about kings and kingdoms. You know, last week, Pastor Adam opened up to the book of Matthew, chapter 1 and chapter 2, and we're going to go there again today. We're going to go to Matthew, chapter 2, if you have your Bibles with, us, with you today. And Matthew chapter 1 describes the earthly lineage of Jesus that in line with King David in fulfillment of prophecy and offering up proof that in an earthly sense, Jesus had every right to be a natural king in the lineage of David over the Jewish people. He fulfills that prophecy coming onto earth and being born in Bethlehem. And as chapter one comes to a close, there is a bit of a scandal though. Joseph is about to marry Mary and he finds out she's pregnant. That's a little bit of an issue. Come on, Jesus, right? You're like, hey, I'm getting ready to marry you, but you're pregnant. What the heck are you talking about, Willis? Right? Like, this, you're like, what is going on here? So he has this moment where, you know, hey, I'm going to silently and quietly and with dignity kind of step away from this marriage. And then he gets this visit by none other than an angel who shows up and says to him, hey, Joseph, hang in there. We need you to be the stepdaddy to the king of kings and lord of lords. That baby who is in her womb is none other than the baby of the king of the universe, God himself, from the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've put you here on earth for such a time as this. Would you embrace this moment? I mean, angel shows up. I'm like, yes, I'm going to follow. You know, so Joseph wisely says, yes, I will embrace this duty. And in our modern day language becomes the stepfather of none other than Jesus, right? If you move on to Matthew chapter 2, things continue to get more interesting. Matthew 2.1. 
Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. They're genuinely coming with a heart of worship as Adam taught us about last week. They're wanting to worship the one true king. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Why is he troubled? Sadly in the natural, kings want to be worshipped themselves. Little K kings that I spoke about last time. These earthly political leaders want to ascribe worship unto themselves. They don't want to bow their knee to anybody. They think everybody needs to bow their knee to them. We see it even in our own generation. They don't want their authority challenged and they're willing to do anything up to and including killing others so that they can maintain their power, right? We've seen it played out in our own generation even as it was in that generation. They're willing to do anything to hold on to their little K kingdoms. Whether they acknowledge it or not, whether they know it or not, many of them are representatives of the kingdom of Satan, They may not even know it. Some blatantly know it and live it out. Others may not even know that they're under the influence of the demonic. Nonetheless, Herod certainly was under that, right? Not only do we as people have this inborn desire to worship others and kings have this inborn desire to be worshiped, we will worship just about anything, right? We look towards the stars of our generations. Right now, probably the biggest one is Taylor Swift, right? Every, I mean, people paying like $800 for a Taylor Swift ticket, right? If you go watch some of the videos of the recent ones, you know, she's actually standing on top of that square that's the same one like that the Muslims go around in circles doing it. But she's there and people, the Swifties, it would be hard to say, are not worshiping Taylor Swift, Right? I mean, there's this essence of it. People innately want that, and they'll seek out anything until they find the one true king, Jesus, the real one who is worthy of all worship, honor, and praise. Previous generations, maybe it was groups like the Beatles or Elvis, who was the king of rock and roll, right? How about Michael Jackson, the king of pop? Or Whitney Houston, who was the queen of soul, right? Sadly, almost every single one of them died very tragic deaths, being kings in their own minds, right? The devil does that to his people. He takes them out. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. King Herod is savvy. He thinks he's smarter than the wise men. He starts a line of questioning, Matthew 4, 4. And when they had gathered the chief priests and scribes and the people all together, he inquired of them of where Christ was to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you Bethlehem and the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring him back Bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. That was Adam's jumping off point for a true heart of worship. If you missed that message last week, go listen to it. Herod certainly did not have a real heart of worship, but he lied about the fact that he wanted to worship. In fact, he had much more sinister plans for this newborn king. He was talking lies, or as you young people say, and I hear, he be capping, right? He be capping right now, and it ain't good, and he be lying, and he be cheating, and he be stealing, and it had nothing to do with worship and everything to do. That's the only part of this message that you're actually going to remember next week, isn't it? (laughs) Everything to do with holding on to power. Everything to do with holding on to power. Matthew 4, 9. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Maybe that star has brought you here today. Maybe not one physically in the sky, but the Holy Spirit has brought you here today to hear this message that your life might be transformed. 
When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him authentically. And when they opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. Right? God gave them wisdom, knowledge, understanding. They departed and went another way. Last bit of this verse, then we'll move on. <clears throat> when they departed, behold... An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise and take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, stay there until I bring you word for Herod will seek the child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord to the prophet saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. So this is where I want to jump off on this set of verses. Adam jumped off on the aspect of worship. Why did Jesus have to go to Egypt? What did Egypt represent? Egypt was both a place of salvation to a degree at one season in the point of the Jewish people, but also a place of slavery and bondage for the Jewish people. So he had to go into Egypt and come out of Egypt, I attest to you, and will make the case today that you might be set free. That you might be set free to fully worship the one true king. He loves you just that much. Let's roll back all the way to the book of Exodus for a moment. Egypt has been historically important to the Jewish people even today. If you look at the war that's going on in Gaza, where is the one part where the tip is? It's going into Egypt where they are connected. That's where a lot of the debates and treaties and other things are even occurring even in our own generation here today. So there's a moment where God allowed Joseph to become second in command to Pharaoh to save, literally save, the Jewish people from death and destruction. You remember that story? If you don't know it, I encourage you to go read it. God miraculously puts him in a position through all these crazy circumstances where he ends up being second in command. There's a great famine that goes out into the land and he is able to bring his family and the other Israelites into Egypt at a place where they are saved. They begin to grow. They begin to multiply as a people under that peace. And then there comes a day where the new Pharaoh who is over Egypt forgets all that Joseph had done for the people of Egypt and for the Jewish people. He, much like Herod and the generation that we talked about, begins to get scared. He looks at them and he's starting to fear their numbers. He's saying, guess what? They're starting to outnumber us. We need to do something about this. We can't let this go on. So he says, hey, let's go out there and kill all the firstborn. Remember that story? Moses actually miraculously is saved from that and later rises up to be a savior in his own generation. But he begins to enslave them. He begins to oppress them as the devil does in every single generation. He wants to enslave us. He wants to oppress us. He wants to keep us from worshiping the one true king. In Jesus' generation, if you'll remember some of the connections there, part of why he had to flee to Egypt was because Herod was to issue an edict that all the firstborn kids would be killed as well. So Jesus goes into Egypt to be spared that death that would happen to the innocents in his generation. The devil always wants to kill the innocents as well, does he not? He is evil. Come on, Jesus. Let this war come to an end. Chapter 1, verse 8, tells us of that new king who comes onto the scene who didn't remember Joseph. Even in their enslavement, God continues to allow their numbers to grow, and he feared they would overwhelm and overpower his kingdom. Thus, he lashes out with those edicts. The devil is going to continue to throw shade all the time, but I'm here to tell you, even in the midst of any evil he tries to put on you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can still prosper. You can still grow. You can still thrive. You can still overcome. He has no dominion over you. Hallelujah. I'm going to grab my water. 
about to get real up in here. Come on. Anybody excited? It's for freedom. He came to set you free. Moses in that generation gets to see all that the world has to offer, yet he himself would go and follow God and lead God's people as a type and shadow of Savior into the promised land. At the timing of Jesus' birth, as I said just a moment ago, Herod, fearing the loss of his own kingdom, issues that similar edict that all the firstborn Jewish people would be killed. He massacred all of the innocent children two years and under. Dare I say we do this even in our own generation to maintain our own kingdoms. How many in our own generation sacrifice their unborn children on the altars of abortion so that we can continue to keep the status quo and keep our little K kingdoms alive? You're welcome to your women's rights But to God, it's no less than killing the innocent. It's exactly what they were tricked to do in those other generations. Is there repentance? Yes. Is there freedom? Yes. But when you see these rabid people in our own generation striving and longing to say that these are women's rights, they are inspired by none other than Satan. I'm here to tell you there's two kingdoms at war with one another. Why do you think they do that kind of stuff? People don't act that kind of crazy if they're not demonically inspired. Who goes out there and says, my cause in life is the killing of babies. Hallelujah, Jesus. Demonic. Demonic. Young people do not listen to them. It is a bed of lies. The devil wants to enslave or kill all of us. Matthew 4.13 Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you the word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the king child and his mother by the night and departed to Egypt, and he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. So why does it continue to be relevant for us today? As I said, it's a place of enslavement and bondage. It's a place of oppression. It's a place of death. In our own generation, with great cunning, the devil continues to try to do the same things. He'll try to trick us with something small. It's Christmas time. Why don't you have some of that cider with a little bit of alcohol in it? For many, alcohol is absolutely no problem at all. But for some of us, like me, that can kind of become a problem down the road, right? So all of a sudden, we get this one little drink, and it tastes so good, and it's so warm going down, and it's awesome, and it's wonderful, and maybe we want one more because it makes us feel a little bit more free, and we can get loose, and we can now talk to other people. And maybe you feel like a nerd like I did, and you can't talk to girls, so you got to go drink some alcohol so that you can then talk to girls. But then before you know it, that once in a while type thing becomes an everyday kind of thing. And before when you had fun that one Christmas where you maybe took that one little drink, all of a sudden you're embarrassing yourself, your wife, and your family at a future Christmas. I'm speaking of myself. True stories. (laughs) Incredibly awful stories. Or that one simple little thing where he gives you that taste of something that seems so good, all of a sudden turns into something terrible that brings death and destruction to you and your family, right? Maybe yours isn't alcohol, but he is greatly cunning. I think of other things and how he just multiplies them in generations. And I'll get off of some of the harder stuff and go into the great stuff of the freedom in just a second. But I remember like in my day... um, we would, ha- we, as young kids, we would drive through and there would be garbage pickups in our, in our area where they have special garbage pickup days. And as young kids, we would go explore those garbage pickups and then maybe stumble upon a, a pile of Playboy magazines. We'd be like, oh man, you know, oh. And then all of a sudden the Playboy stuff has to turn into another brand that is a bit more hardcore. And I think about the pains and challenges of our own generation when it's everywhere all the time. 
They don't have to go to some back room place or go try to find some magazine somewhere or stumble upon it. They could do a simple internet search and all of a sudden you find more stuff than you'd ever found in our generation before. The devil's multiplying the madness on them, right? Think about he did it through the 60s and free love and everything's good and then now it's all just insanity, is it not? So he's transformed it so much. I don't know if you saw the headline of this week. So a Senate staffer is found having gay sex for, on film, not just going there to have sex, on the Senate floor when nobody's there, so that he's thinking this is okay to go form an amateur gay porn video in the Senate halls. That's how far it goes. That's how the insanity goes. I'm not here to talk about any political party. You know me know enough to do that. But it, did you, if any of you have not seen the most recent um, one from the, the president's wife's office of the Christmas video that they put out, it's half full of, you know, transgender, full of gay, full of uh, half hunger games, basically, if you go watch it. The incent, like, how is this supposed to glorify Jesus in any way, shape, form that you're going to bring all of this stuff into the White House? So what starts here with one simple drink, what starts here with Hugh Hefner and Playboy, the devil always takes to these extremes over here on the other side to enslave an entire generation of people. That's what we're witnessing in our generation. The madness, I hope, is reaching its peak because if it's not, man, Jesus better come soon because the craziness that's out there is absolutely and utterly insane. Jesus' job was to go into Egypt to demonstrate his rescue mission would include saving us from our sins, saving us from our strongholds, saving us from our bondages, freeing us from the things that attempt to enslave us. And yes, Christians, we are often enslaved as well. We believe in Jesus Christ, but there's strongholds in our life that we've allowed to be there. And maybe today God wants to send that stronghold tumbling down in your life. He brought you here to hear this message to set you free. Luke 4, 18 says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and restoration of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Galatians 5, 1 says, it is for freedom that Christ came to set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Christians, you were not meant to live as slaves. You were meant to live free. You were not meant to be captives. You were meant to take ground. You were meant to put the enemy back. Jesus was born in Bethlehem as king, the one whose name is above every other name to which every name under heaven and earth must bow down, either here or one day will. Every ruler can go act like they rule, but one day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. If you're here and you've been stuck in bondage for some time, I was a Christian for six or seven years before I got freed fully from addiction. You can be set free. That stronghold can be broken. Your sin can be forgiven. You can overcome. See, it even says later in scripture that not only did Jesus come out of Egypt, it said after dying on the cross, he descended into hell, took the keys of hell, death, and the grave, and rose again. He went down there to prove that he had dominion over sin. If he could save you from sin and bring you into heaven, he could solve any of the challenges that you have here on earth. He could deliver you from whatever earthly hell you or a loved one finds themselves in right now. If he did it for me, he could do it for you. If he did it for me, he could do it for you. Where does it start? If we go back to the book of Exodus for just a moment. Exodus 2.23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. When the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, they cried out and their cry came out to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them and ultimately he set their rescue plan into motion. If you're here today and you're in bondage, I want to encourage you to cry out. Say, God would just set me free. That's what I did. I would go use drugs that day. I would go use alcohol that day. I would go do sinful things that day. And I would lay my head down at night as a believer in Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, I don't want to do this again tomorrow. And sadly, many tomorrows came and I did it again. And I did it again. But one day God heard my cry and answered that prayer. And he set me free. So if you're here today and you're struggling with any stronghold, I want to encourage you in just a moment. We're going to open up these altars. I pray you'll flood them. If you're not struggling with something here today, amen, hallelujah, Jesus, I am so happy for you. We'll deal with your pride later. I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Um, Then maybe you could come up here because I bet you know some people in your family, your friends, circles, your loved ones that are struggling right now. And I believe God can use intercessors to break through and make a difference in the lives of others. So this Christmas season, could we all come up here and either ask God for help ourselves or intercede on behalf of another one? If you're here today and you're sick and tired, just as when Joseph was visited from angels to prepare for the birth of Jesus, And angels came to usher in the good news of great joy that a king was born to set all mankind free. Believe that angels are in this very room today coming to herald that even one might come to know Jesus or celebrate with others as you get the freedom that you so long to have. It says in Luke 15, 10, I tell you there's rejoicing in the presence of angels over one who repents. Why do they rejoice? Not because they're surprised, but because that day a great victory is won. A victory over sin, a victory over hell, a victory over the devil that day. And I believe there's angels in this room that want to rejoice along with us today. I believe great victories are going to be won in this very room this very day. And I believe that God brought you here on purpose for a reason. Even to those of you who might find yourself online today, maybe you couldn't make it here physically, but there's no reason that if you're in your own room right now, you can't let the tears flow, you can't repent, you can't cry out, you can't say, Lord, would you help me right here, right now, right where I'm at. Maybe you, like me, are struggling with some form of addiction and you know, you're afraid to go see your family this year because you don't wanna make a fool of yourself. Maybe this will be your first Christmas sober in a very long time. God's here in this place. Would you rise with me? Would you pray? Would you worship? If you're part of the prayer team, feel free to come on up to the front. It's for freedom. He set you free.